had a pretty large bang associated with the um, caution and warning them. Okay. As we have an apparent serious oxygen leak. Hello, listener, and welcome to Failure to Launch, the space history podcast where we walk you through every mistake, failure, and explosion that made modern space exploration possible. We are your hosts, Quinn, he, him, Chris, he, him, and an observant Chris, he, him. And today we're going to be talking about Max Vallier, the first rocket evangelist. How are you guys doing? All right, loaded question, I know. You told me beforehand, and I lobbed it at you anyway. That wasn't the question. No, it was about the title, but we'll get to that. I'm. I'm doing sufficient for a record today. How are we doing? That is the best thing that a podcaster can be. Yeah. A two hour drive and slipping right into the the podcasting mind. Feed some cats into the pod cave. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm ready for this. I think this is the first time I'm actually hearing about this subject matter. You actually didn't spoil us at all about this. <sighs> okay, so I think you're... You, you kind of mixed two of the questions in because the next one is meant to be like, hey, have you ever heard of this guy? And you're you're too well trained. You're getting. Yeah. If you want to talk about the most blind topic I know nothing about, I think you just hit it. And, and this is a topic. Uh, if I didn't spoil it to you guys, it's because I'm excited about it. And also I was very busy. This topic is one that I have been excited about for a while since I love this period of the first rocket craze. This is the time between World War I and World War II where rocketry first became a serious field of study. And you had, you know, visionaries like Hermann Oberth, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, and Robert Goddard doing work that had later, you know, it inspired engineers like Werner von Braun and Sergei Korolev, the guys who we've talked about most. These Basically, these rocket guys kind of come in generations. And the first generation in the 20s and 30s inspired the guys that we know who did work in the 50s and 60s. And so far, we've only really touched on this period whenever we talked about Gerhard Zucker, uh, who was a complete sham and a fraud. The guy who sucked. S- yeah. Zucker the sucker, you know? Hell yeah. Uh, blew up a couple of children that one time. Uh, used, his, used his friend's wife as a spy to go into and to try and smuggle explosives out of Nazi Germany. I'm going to squirrel for a moment and brain fart. Zucker was rocket mail, right? Zucker was rocket mail, yeah. I'm just like thinking about like thinking about like local headline for people who paid him for services, Zuckers, suckers, you know. <laughs> and you can also find, uh, as well as like a lot of the other Rocket Mail guys, um, Karel Roberti. Um, you can find covers, uh, the envelopes of the Rocket Mail online on eBay for pretty cheap. For patrons who have supported the show. Some of that may go into uh, some rocket mail. Who knows? I'm probably cutting that. We only use money to support the show for necessary products. Like purchasing the uh, $850,000. Uh, oh, God. <laughs> the, the, the shoot cap from Evil Knievel's <laughs> rocket, the X2. Audience, we have a new patron tier. Chris here was able to find the, the, um, the parachute lid from... The evil Knievel rocket uh, that failed and k- almost killed him. And in the pictures that they show of this thing, it looks suitably fucked up for a piece of hardware that failed. Uh, the downside is they are charging $850,000 US for it. So tell a friend, get him on the patron. That's something. Honestly, honestly, like as far as far as space artifacts, I feel like, you know, there's more money in evil can evil artifacts there's got to be because you can buy like entire chunks of a soyuz spacecraft for less money than that it's true i mean because it was a soyuz spacecraft it's not evil can evil you know well yeah and there's been more than one soyuz How and many? there's been exactly. only one exactly e- there's been only one evil can evil rocket crash well was the evil can evil you know craft was it wiggled beforehand expertly it probably wasn't it was a. It was basically a hot, like a water heater. So it would have been very scalding to do that. Yeah, that, there we go. 
you're paying for the wiggle with the Soyuz. If they had wiggled the Soyuz, that might have actually just popped loose the bolts, and those guys would have died sooner. It was the Salyut that got wiggled, and it didn't have any problems. Sorry, I'm thinking Soyuz. Sol- Solute, cereal, Salyut, Cereal. Salyut, Thomas. You're doing the same thing I was going to do. <laughs> to kind of tie it in with Evil Knievel, the guy we're going to talk about today, he's not really a rocket expert. He is a hype man, and he is the first space hype man and probably the most effective in history. Um, this is a guy called Max Vallier. And normally I would ask if you guys had ever heard of this, but we already established because A, I did not spoil it, and B, you, Chris, said it in the intro, you have not heard of this guy. We're going to learn all about him and we're going to have some fun. Also, if you are interested in our work and want to find more of it, we do have a Patreon. If you sign up at any tier, you get access to our monthly bonus episodes and our entire backlog of space movie reviews. If you sign up at higher tiers, we are going to be rolling out monthly mini-sodes, so look forward to that. Also, for sourcing, I'm mostly going to be using the book Max Vallier, A Pioneer of Space Travel by Ilsa Essers. Um, as always, links will be in the show notes. Max's Early Life Now, Max Vallier was born on February 9th, 1895, in the city of Bozen in Austria-Hungary, now the city of Bolzano, Italy. Uh, so right off the bat, we know we're going to have fun because we are talking about Austria-Hungary. My favorite pair of idiots, Austria and Hungary. And don't worry, we are going to talk about World War I. So the Vallier family were actually bakers, going back generations. It was even traditional for Vallier sons to travel to Paris to study at some of the best bakeries before scattering across Europe. Fortunately for space travel, and unfortunately for the Vallier family, this was not to be for young Max. His father died before he was one, which left his wife to support the entire family, and Max was mostly raised by his aunt. And from a young age, Max was obsessed with astronomy, not baking. Though the family was desperately poor, Max had an old telescope his grandfather had gifted him and spent as much time as possible using it and researching the stars. According to his stepsister, who we get most of our information on his early life from, One Christmas, Max's mother and aunt saved up to get him an old camera tripod, and he was then able to, like, jury-rig it to his telescope. And then he was able to build other accessories for the telescope, telescope, like, out of old scrap he found. Which I I love. I've done done similar little things, but never anything as as wild as a telescope. Yeah, that's pretty amazing if you think about it, getting all the focal lengths cracked. Well, I mean, the telescope wasn't, uh, the telescope was the only thing that was not homemade. Like, it was a legit telescope. It was, um... Yeah, but slamming a camera into that Max, is it? Max Vallier created a homemade telescope using a jury-rigged uh, camera tripod, telescope. a telescope, and jury-rigged parts, and a telescope. It is it is still pretty impressive, but it's not, yeah, it's not like he was carving down the, uh, he didn't have to worry about the focal lengths or anything like that. How old was he at this time, roughly? I believe he's less than 10. Unfortunately, there is not a load written about this guy. Um, And Ilse Esser's book loses, I I think it kind of loses something because it is translated from German and not that great. German listeners, if you could help. I will send you five, I will send you about 300 pages and I need a PDF back, preferably 48 hours. But yeah, when I say Max was obsessed with astronomy, I mean it. Despite being too poor to buy warm clothing, Max still went out in the middle of the night in the dead of winter in the fucking Alps to stargaze. That's dedication. You won't get that from kids these days. All they know is <laughs> is scroll day phone, uh, plants for zombies, they iPad, uh, uh, tweet, they TikToks. Damn, I was going to see if you could do five more. Ah, uh, well, I don't know. Yeah, (laughs) I was hoping someone else was going to jump on to that. But so not content to just look at the stars. Anytime Max was able to make a bit of money, he'd immediately invest it in the newest astronomy textbooks. So this kid is dedicated from a very young age. This is what he wants to do. In 1913, Max enrolled in the University of Innsbruck to study astronomy and physics. His time at school allowed him to hone his interests even further, and he became obsessed with rockets. One of his earliest experiments was to build a model airplane and hook a bunch of fireworks rockets to it. Uh, It flew for miles and it landed intact in the next in the next. um, It flew for miles and it landed intact in the next city district over. Oh, hell yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. 
Also, presciently, Max designed his rocket plane with staged motors, so instead of firing all of the rockets at once, he had them in a row, and each would fire in sequence before lighting the one behind them, making it fly much further. Zam, he's ten? Uh, well, he's past, He's a university student now, so he's got to be like, well, I mean, this is the olden days, so he's, ma- I don't know, twelve? I, I, Zam, yeah, he's growing, growing up, Growing up in the old days, I, I don't know. No, he's he's probably like 19 or something. Let's be realistic. I was about to say Max Vallier, boy genius, telling me that he's not a scientist, huh? Well, we'll get there because he finds other talents. Whenever it came to his studies, his peers remembered Max as being a decent student, a very good speaker, and a horrible listener, uh, which does track with a load of rocket guys we've talked about. Max really enjoyed telling other people about astronomy, and he believed firmly that more people would be interested in the stars if the textbooks weren't so A, expensive, and B, complicated. See, Max had a talent that is often neglected in scientific fields. He could talk to normal people. Max was both motivated to, and really good at, finding ways to break down complex scientific theories simply and concisely. Starting while he was still a student at Innsbruck, he published a series of treatises on stargazing to try and drum up some space hype. And this is more just a, a dumb me nitpick. I don't exactly know what a treatise is. I've seen it talked about so much in old timey kind of like it's longer than a pamphlet, but it's less than an article. I don't know. I thought a treatise was a, a pretty long paper. It, like, it could be longer than an essay. Like a like a thorough explanation on a certain subject. I, I do think that is what he that is what he's writing. He's writing thorough explanations of these subjects, and he's kind of I don't want to say dumbing it down. He's communicating effectively. We'll get to this later, but he kind of winds up being the Bill Nye of his day. Yeah, the way you're building him up makes it sound like he's like one of those like science infotainers. Like he is one of the first mass media science communicators, and he focuses this. You know, like uh, you know Bill Nye. Talked about all kinds of different things. Max Vallier focuses everything on space, astronomy, and rockets. He's kind of like us. Whoa. An incredibly effective and charismatic child genius. Uh, science can... Oh, oh. That's all wow. of us right there. It's Max Vallier on the show, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. So, as people started to take notice, Max's reach grew. He started writing articles for local newspapers, which got him noticed by bigger scientific publishing houses. Keep in mind, he's 20 and still in his third year at college. Max liked to mix fantastical and the educational. His first written work, uh, longer than a treatise, was actually a short opera called The Moon Fairy, about the conflicts and love that arise when a group of humans visit a lunar civilization. With a fixation on astronomy and his love for writing, Max soon picked up a really appropriate nickname from female classmates, the Troubadour of the Stars, after the medieval poet knights. Ab- a- amazing S tier. Which I, does, he, it is an incredible nickname. And at the same time, like, I can relate so much to this guy. He had a micro fixation and he wanted to teach people about it. A- and he, f- he found outlets to vent his love of his micro fixation. I'm not, my ego uh, will not allow me to draw like a one to one to our show, but I will say that Max Vallier, if he were alive today, rhyming whatever, would have been an incredible podcaster. We haven't even gotten into, like, the meat and potatoes yet, and I already like this guy a whole lot, so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it gets funny later. Uh, he is not without his flaws. No, I, especially when you, he's going to have an ego. Okay, we, we all know this. Well, yeah. There is going to be a flaw. One of the flaws right away, no one wanted to print the Moon Fairy. That's a crime. It didn't sell good. Max's first published work would be a booklet about 100 pages long called Astronomical Mapping. Quote, The Nature and Culture Publishing House in Munich thus accepted the manuscript of a student who, at the time, was in the third term. In this part of his life, the young student generally assumes an academic arrogance, especially if he is the first university man in his family. Max Vallier was not like that. The subtitle of his booklet was a lucid, understandable initiation into the observation and graphic representation of celestial objects after looking in the telescope, destined for laymen and amateur astronomers. That's a light novel name if I've ever heard one. It kind of is, but at the same time, like, and as wordy as that intro is, he is being very clear right off the bat that, like, he wants this to reach normal people. He wants to make it understandable. He's, like, he's drawing in observations of the stars so that if someone looks in a telescope... 
they're able to have like a visual guide to the sky. My girlfriend is on the moon and she's gazing back at me through the telescope and I like, whoa, <laughs> part one. Are you saying whoa or hitting the whoa? It's hitting the whoa. Thank you for the confirmation. <laughs> Reassuring our fans that we are indeed hitting the whoa right now. Now, Max's next plan was to tackle heaven in the book Orbit and the Nature of the Stars. Unfortunately for his dozens of fans, this book got a little delayed. He started work in 1914, and people who know history might be aware of a different thing that started in 1914. World War I. Max at war. Now, Max actually got a little lucky. While the war greatly impacted and slowed down his studies, he wasn't actually drafted into the Austro-Hungarian army until 1915. Uh, this is actually because his parents had never bothered to register his birth, so in government records he wasn't actually a citizen of Austria. By 1915, though, things had gotten bad enough that the Empire decided to just start drafting anyone, and Max got caught up in it. Like, one year in, things were bad enough that Austro-Hungaria was just like, hey, do you have a pulse? Cool. Yeah, I was going to say that, like, he avoided the first year. That that year in and of itself may as well have been an eternity. Yeah. <laughs> and it's unfortunate for him that there are three eternities to go, so. It does not get better, audience. <laughs> As we'll talk about, he does not have the worst time in World War I. So, according to people who knew him, Max was not a natural soldier, and he actually probably never fired a shot in anger. His roles, fitting his nature and education, were always technical. He was first assigned to the Italian front as a mountain infantryman, where he served as a weather observer. Uh, so, for those who don't know, at the start of World War I, Italy was part of the Triple Alliance with Germany and Austria-Hungary. A year later... They switched sides and invaded Austria-Hungary to try and annex some of that sweet territory. Like most things involving a world war and Italy, it did not go well. So this is where the memes of like the, the 27th Battle of the Isonzo come from. Thank you, Luigi Gadorna. Hell yeah. <laughs> uh, honestly, you could just do like a Lions Led by Donkeys show purely just about every single Battle of the Isonzo. And you could run it for a while. I've definitely mentioned it before, but my great grandfather was in the Alpini. Dude, awesome. And I you're here, so he survived. I don't know if he fought in the Isonzo, but I do know he fought the Austro Hungarians in the Alps, so. Mm, he might have fought Max Vallier. Now, you might be wondering, like, what use a weather observer was in a war. And when both sides use things like balloons, scout planes, and poison gas, uh, it turns out that a weather observer is very important. When Max was reassigned to a German unit fighting in Russia, he apparently saved an entire regiment from an incoming gas attack and was able to like, warn them to get out of the way, only for it to turn out that it was actually German gas that the wind had blown back on them. Hey, either way, the vibes are wrong. <laughs> I do just love the idea. Like, I have to imagine the, the artillery guys also had a weather dude. And he was like, the wind is blowing through his hair. And he just <laughs> starts just like, running yes, away from it, them. Fire it upwind. Surely nothing wrong will come of this. You, you know for an absolute fact that as soon as the wind turned around, that guy started booking it. I'm just now imagining like a young Austrian dude. Uh, wearing a gas mask with like huge flowing hair and that's just how you know where to fire the shells and then him forced gumping it out of there <laughs> just immaculate oh, form it. we're done see ya now working as a weather observer gave max a lot of time to stargaze and write his two main hobbies and he decided to use his knack for writing to help his fellow soldiers he wrote The Booklet of Stars for Everyone, a sort of 101 guide for stargazing that soldiers on board night watches could read. Um, and this was so popular that it sold out immediately, and so did every single printing after. So, like, all along the trench line, some of these actually, like, there are reports that these things wind up captured and used by the Italians. I just, like, kill that, get that fucking, uh, that fucking stargaze chart, you I am bored. the stars get him. Doing a trench raid to grab the reading material and bringing it back to your lines. Better yet, doing a trench raid and capturing Max Vallier to force him to show you how to do it himself. <laughs> the most militant form of astrology known to man. <laughs> Locking Bill Nye in a cell as a prisoner of war and forcing him to make <laughs> science education for you. It's <laughs> like giving him a big textbook on robotics and just like, Explain it to me. I want to learn. 
How does the how does how does the magic sand work? No. Valier was also ambitious and eager to test things. He convinced his commanders that he'd be able to observe better from a plane, and he got himself promoted to the role of pilot observer. From there, it was a short hop to becoming a test pilot, flying in some of the newest and best aircraft around. So he was like, and in these aircraft, they are pushing new speed and altitude records, um, as well as putting these aircraft through their paces, they are doing legitimate, like, high altitude in, in 1916 research. And this actually, more than anything, convinced him that rockets were the way of the future, not propellers. Because, like, he's flying in these biplanes, he's pushing the world speed record for an aircraft, and it's not that fast. And he kind of comes away thoroughly unimpressed. Like, his little homemade rocket flew faster than any of the biplanes he was riding in. Now, the war actually ended while Valier was in a hospital, recovering from a crash, and his hometown was one of the uh, chunks of Austria annexed into Italy. Um, so Max was left without a home, stranded in Vienna. He has become Italian. I just... Okay. It is... It is. I know this is actually how it works and how a lot of wars end, like territory is exchanged, but I do love in the Treaty of Versailles, there's a bullet point that just, Max Valier is Italian now. You are legally Italian. Sir, do, do not resist. You are Italian now. <laughs> I was going to make a joke, but I pride myself in not doing that. What are you chuckling at now? What what joke did you think of? You're legally obligated to put any bits into the podcast pile. You're not allowed to laugh to yourself. This is a podcast. You're you're allowed to laugh with our audience. Your fate, Italian. <laughs> That's too good. But no, just he tries to make some, you know, native Austrian Hungarian dishes gets tased. No, no, no. <laughs> Bailiff, make him Italian. <laughs> Slams gavel down. What if you only get, like, is it for life, or do you just get sentenced for it to, to be Italian for a time? Uh, severity of the crime. Mm, okay, okay. But can you do a crime big enough to make you Austrian again, is what I wonder. No. No. Because the punishment mm. is becoming Italian and having to give up the food, which okay. I'm assuming is worse than Italian food, but don't tell them that. Capital, but you can't capitally punish the entire world by making something making Austro Hungarian again. So, it's the great, the great leveler, <laughs> everyone becomes Austro Hungarian. So, Max being injured and in a hospital actually saves him from becoming Italian, uh, but he is left homeless in Vienna. But he was not without help because he had fans. Oh. And during the war, he picked up a truly weird fan named Hans Horbiger. What a guy. What a guy. You're going to love him even more once I explain him. Hans had started reading Max's earlier work, and he really enjoyed it. He wrote Max a few times, and they became pen pals for the duration of the war. Max bouncing writing ideas off of Hans, while Hans sent Max all kinds of dumb pseudoscientific essays. Do you want to guess if these worked? Oh, of course they did. I'm coin flip on this. Uh, well, I'm going to have to give it to Chris, because of course they fucking did. See... Hans Horbiger was the man who invented the theory of glacial cosmogony. It's cosmology, but replace, like, it, it's cosmogony. Um, You're just inventing words now. I didn't. Horbiger did. And I don't really know how to do this dumb idea justice, so I'm just going to quote from the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science. Quote, the cosmic ice theory was discovered by the Austrian engineer Hans Horbiger in 1894 in the course of an epiphanic vision. He supposed ice to be the basic substance of all cosmic processes, most importantly materialized in the moon, the Milky Way, and the ether. Apart from purporting to explain all the astronomical and geological and meteorological phenomena, in German this is called the Weltislehre, uh, was also said to be the foundation of a new cosmic cultural history, forming both a scientific, philosophical, poetic, artistic, and cosmotechnical worldview that Horbiger called an astronomy of the invisible. Uh, so this is utterly insane, and needless to say, Max got super pilled on this bullshit. But I like it. Funny words, magic man. <laughs> yeah, just like you are sitting in an like you're sitting in a 1916 military hospital. You are if you are lucky, so high on morphine and you're reading a letter from Mr. Horbiger that's just like ice. Ice is everything. What if you're made of ice? What if I'm made of ice? Ice. Fix Where does ice. it come from? 
It has to be from the cosmos. Just Vix and ice. It comes down from above. It's, it's from the cosmic medium. It's everything. It's ice. That is legitimately a more coherent way of describing this than like anything Hans Horbiger ever wrote. But at the same time, I do love that he starts with the idea like, what if everything is ice? And then he's like, this is a philosophy now. This is artistic, poetic, cosmo-technical, scientific. Like, it's not just a theory. He thought this was a worldview. My man would have made a cult out of this. I'm surprised he didn't. He's too focused on... Um, the stars. Yeah, he's too focused on his main subject matter to deviate from it at the moment. Well, hold on, because Max, like I said, gets immediately pilled on this. And he became a big proponent for glacial cosmogony for the rest of his life. Damn. The Space Evangelist. Now, despite the bleak times, Max Vallier was able to bounce back pretty quick after the war. He got a job at a local university as a lecturer on astronomy, where he used his skills as a hype man to educate new generations of astronomers, hold after-hours lectures for the common folk of Vienna, and try to mix as much glacial cosmogony into the real science as he could. Oh, he's trying to synthesize something. He'll be teaching you 90% science, and then maybe there'll just be some ice cube stuff in there. He also continued at a truly frightening pace and on a very weird mix of topics. So there is something I love, which is this subset of sci-fi writers, especially in this period, that just tur like churns out dozens of books a week. Like, this is your L. Ron Hubbard types. And Valier definitely fits into that category, because he writes a fuck ton. And a lot of this was actually due to survival as much as education. In both Austria and Germany, inflation was going wild in the early 20s, and Valier relied on writing as many exciting books and articles as possible as a way to make some extra cash. He wrote more books about astronomy, like Stargazer and Fundamentals of Cosmo Technology. He did some speculative sci-fi with the book Spiridon Illuxt, which actually may have predicted the atomic bomb, and he even got weirdly into the occult, tying it in with his love of space. The book The Transcendental Vision, for example, is about the interplay of psyche and physics, or basically how you can move things with your mind, while Things of the Beyond is about how spirituality impacts time. So I think this is fine and neat. I think it's cool that he's writing about all these subjects. Um, unfortunately, the hard pivot into occult shit did throw off some of his fans, and it was so off-putting that even Hans Horbiger, the guy who, like, invented the stupid ice philosophy, was like, Hey man, maybe tone it down. You're gonna give cosmic, uh, you're gonna give glacial cosmogony a bad name. Back up! You're scaring the believers. <laughs> like, don't get them into that cult. We're not going cross cultism here. <laughs> you're not whimsical and silly. You're not a little guy. <laughs> you're unsettling, and you're scaring the believers. Oh. Also, in this time, Max met and married Hedwig Valier, and the family moved to Munich, where Max's books only made him more famous. I want to be clear about this. Like we talked about before, he was basically the Bill Nye of his day, a king of science education and promotion with a knack for explaining complex topics in fun and interesting ways. He kept the book's tones upbeat and aspirational, which played well in a time when people were struggling. His books were short so they could be cheap and anyone could afford them. He told stories about how wonderful the future would be and how rockets would revolutionize everything from cars to trains to airplanes. Max's articles were translated and reprinted all across Europe. And then, in 1924, Max Vallier discovered the work of Hermann Oberth. Uh, so, have you guys ever heard of Oberth? No. But no, I'm not terribly familiar with his works. Which is to say, no. I'm afraid I haven't even heard of his name. So we will definitely talk about him more in the future. While nowadays, Hermann is remembered as one of the, like, fathers of modern rocketry, and, like, in brackets here I have written, and a big ol' Nazi. Oh. Back then, he was a little-known academic who had just gotten his doctorate. He published his first work in 1923, Die Raketa zu den Planetenraumen, or, I probably fucked that up, I don't care, or The Rocket into Planetary Space, and it did not do too well. It was savaged by some pretty stupid academics who argued that it was, you know, utopian or that rockets can't work in a vacuum, but it also just didn't sell well. Oberth was a physicist, and he wrote like a physicist, and that meant that his work was basically just hundreds of pages of wall-to-wall -wall equations that no one could read. Boring. Yeah, and... This is where Valier comes in, because Valier discovered Oberth's work and decided to boost it. He decided to basically be Oberth's translator. 
he decides like this is finally a good thing he does. He decides to do the exact same thing that he did for Hans Horbiger, except now the work he was boosting was de- like actually determined by math and not prophetic dreams. Quote, he devoted his inexhaustible energies to a crusade for Oberth's ideas, beginning with a popular book, The Advance into Outer Space, in 1924. This sold well enough to go into a second printing by 1925 and greatly aided the sale of Oberth's book, which sold out and was reprinted in 1925 as well. Vallier also published a number of illustrated articles on spaceflight in popular newspapers and magazines, some with very large circulations. So Max's idea was that any money he generated from this boosting would go to funding actual tests of Oberth's work. For the next couple of years, Oberth and Vallier traded letters, Max again offering writing advice and Hermann trying to teach Max about rocket equations. Um, they did not always get along, especially when Max tried to pill Hermann on gl- uh, glacial cosmogony, uh, but they worked well enough together and they coordinated their work. Anytime Oberth was about to release a book or scientific article, Vallier would be there to translate it into normal people speak and get it into every newspaper possible. That sounds like a really good job, gig, DBH. It kind of is, yeah. And it, like, it can be a really good gig. It's also, you know, incredibly valuable. Because without Vallier's work, it's, I don't know how likely, but like Oberth was writing this incredible new rocket, like science, into a journal that no one read and no one cared. And anyone who did read made fun of him because they were, you know, close-minded. A big part of why Oberth is able to develop and become legitimately one of the fathers of modern rocketry is because of Vallier boosting him. Are you saying the man that made his work digestible was not appreciated? Well, no, uh, they, they, they were both pretty well appreciated. Um, it's just that without making his work digestible, Oberth would not have been appreciated. And yet, for all his networking skill, Vallier misjudged how rocket programs actually work. Educating the public is all well and good. That's what gets people to actually study space, join clubs, and get into the industry. But if you actually want to build and launch a rocket, you need backing from big players. And Vallier never really tried to woo any industrial or government players. From his letter, we see that he just kind of expected them to show up if he made enough noise in the newspapers. And I think this is interesting because we see that he really believed in this. In his head, rockets were the coolest things ever. And if he shared them with people, they'd all believe rockets were cool too. The government would have to fund this new science because how could they not? But that did not happen. And you can't crowdfund a real rocket program, especially not in 1920s Germany. Um, Vallier and Oberth did come close to convincing the uh, the Junkers, Junkers, whatever, aircraft company. You had it, Junkers. It is Junkers? Junkers. Okay. It's It's a soft yay. Yeah, yay Junkers. (laughs) I don't think that branding would go good considering the no, war they're about to get into. considering the things afterwards. <laughs> yay no. for Junkers. Woo! Um, yay for Junkers. <laughs> we all go yay for Junkers. Uh, London, London children in the Blitz. They released that branding that five years later. Oh, God, no. So, Valier actually came pretty close to convincing Junkers to allow him to modify one of their aircraft to be rocket-powered. And it's really interesting how he did this, because Vallier didn't believe in building something from scratch. He liked slowly iterating and modifying. So his plan was that over generations of aircraft, like the first plan was to replace two engines. It's a it's a three engine aircraft. He was going to replace two of the engines with rockets, and then he would replace the middle engine with rockets. And then he would like slowly build out this aircraft with more and more parts to go further and further into space until you had like a weird, it's kind of like a ship of Theseus situation where you never really know what the initial somewhere buried in there is still a little bit of a Junkers aircraft, but it just looks like a rocket ship now. Slowly becoming a rocket ship. Yeah, like like generation by generation, not a load of generations. It's like Animorphs, you know, it's an Animorphs cover where it starts with a Junkers aircraft and then it becomes uh, like a Soyuz in like five transition shots. It's the strangest mental imagery slash description I think you've ever made about something. Rocket program. After spending a couple of years evangelizing for Hermann, Oberth, and rocketry, Max Vallier was pretty burned out. He dedicated months at a time to lengthy lecture tours all around Europe. 
He wrote constantly, whether books or articles, in his trademark, fun, readable style, and his writing did well. And he helped kick off a legitimate rocket craze. After the runaway inflation and poverty of the early 20s, by 1924, Weimar Germany was stabilizing and entering what was called the Golden Twenties. Among a lot of changes, this period had a lot of futuristic themes. A new Germany was being born, and people were looking to all kinds of new technologies that had completely revolutionized everyday life. Max Vallier and his dreams of rocket ships blasting into space, or even just a rocket train taking you from Munich to Berlin, fit perfectly into this new national mood. And it didn't count for anything. Because again, Max doesn't know how to PR to the right people. All he can do is educate normal people, which is great, which is incredible, it's very important. Normies don't got money, though. Normal people do not have money. What if I'm, I, I'm, I, I say that and then I immediately realize that we have a Patreon and it's just like, no, we should just find a billionaire and get them to fund our podcast. They don't have money in the way that matters to building a rocket train. Yeah, yeah. If Max wanted to actually build something, he'd need backers with money. So he started pitching. The first thing he did was change his focus away from space rockets towards more terrestrial and thus profitable uses for rockets. Planes and trains were something that industry people could understand, and they represented a clear way to make money. Rockets go fast, which means that you can transport more people quicker and make more money. Vallier teamed up with a pair of artists, the Von Romer twins, and started pumping out dozens of technical drawings of rocket planes and trains, each more impossible than the last. He wanted to, like, replicate his near success with the Junkers company and use these images to try and pitch to German corporations. This was actually so blatant and cash grabby that Hermann Oberth cut ties with Vallier, complaining that like by putting out these images, he was actually undoing all of the educational work because he was like, Vallier had established this reputation for I know what rockets are. I'm going to educate you about rockets. Here's an incredibly dumb plane that is meant to make me money. Oh, yeah. They always start off so innocent and then he grows up into the griftosphere. <laughs> He, he's more than burned out. He is he's decomposing right now. Yeah. So something that I didn't talk a whole lot about in this script is that Max Vallier is also um, he's one of the founders of the VFR, uh, which is like the first German rocket club. This is where dudes like like Werner von Braun gets his start in the VFR. But at the same time, like while there are some actual rocket scientists in there, it's also uh, completely dominated and has all of this internal politics going back and forth because it is uh, taken over and co-opted by grifters who just want to like be seen doing a cool like they want to do a pump and dump effectively oh beautiful now while it hurt max's credibility among the scientists and engineers like oberth this new idea did eventually pay off so <laughs> have you guys ever heard of the opel car brand very much so established earlier that chris knew about well, it okay yeah but i i cut that part where you established that you knew what uh, opel was okay, okay 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 well i mean before before you showed me the title read i didn't know okay. what opel was i'm not allowed to look at a 1972 opel manta and say it's a good looking car it is yeah so opel is a german car brand and in 1928 it was actually the largest car manufacturer in germany Fritz von Opel was the fail son of Opel head Wilhelm von Opel, and he was very eager to get out from under Papa's shadow. He saw that Opel got great PR out of his uncle Ricky, so his uncle Ricky raced these cars professionally, like Opel made race cars, and Ricky von Opel raced them in the Grand Prix. And whenever he did that, they got incredible like uh, PR out of it. It helped the company. And this kid, Fritz, he wants to do that. He wants to have his, he wants to like upstage his uncle. And so when he was approached by a suave Austrian dude who wanted to build a rocket car, he went all in. And for this, I'm going to quote from the Air Force magazine. Everyone understood that Vallier was more interested in publicizing rocketry than actually marketing Opel automobiles. However, he was quick to point out that building a successful rocket powered car would achieve both goals. So credit to him for honesty, at least. Hey, he recognized. Yeah, he, he was mercenary about it, but he was being honest. For once, he finally, he, he finally does both, right? Yeah. So, flushed with cash, Valier got in contact with Friedrich Sander, a guy who owned a fireworks factory. Uh, this is because unlike the complex liquid-fueled rockets that Oberth wanted to make, 
Valier planned to build his various rocket vehicles with crude gunpowder fireworks oh rockets. God, he's on his solid state arc. Please no. <laughs> they started small, taking a normal Opel car and only bolting two rockets to it. It traveled about 500 feet and reached a top speed of three miles an hour. Not very fast. No, credit to him. This is about safety. They want to test it and make sure it's safe first and that it doesn't explode and kill anyone. Safety. And then, safety satisfied, they immediately went all in on rockets. Oh, like they got their few, like, good runs and then... Well, basically what they said was, all right, so two rockets is safe. Twelve rockets is going to be six times safer. So the next vehicle was the, the Rock 1, R-A-K-1, and it was a modified race car with the engine replaced by, like I said, 12 rockets. The Wanhu wagon. <laughs> to give you an idea how much power that is, to keep the Rock 1 from flying away, they had to bolt a pair of tiny wings to the side that would push the vehicle against the ground. Because if they didn't have that and it hit a pothole, it would just go into the sky. Even worse, Fritz von Opel wanted to be the one to ride the rocket himself. Like, remember, this guy is a megalomaniac. He wants to, he wants to pump up his company, and he wants to be the person seen doing it. He wants to upstage his, like, race car driver uncle. He's just got to do it. He's got to do it. And Valier was incredibly against this idea, not because he actually cared about Fritz's safety, but because he would lose access to his funding if the billionaire kid blew himself up. Uh, so he needs this meal ticket alive, goddammit. I wanted to say that that was devious, but, I mean, is it really? Is it really? Is it really devious? I mean, I think you can be, yeah. Billionaire fail son? I mean, I don't see a crime here. If you have a billionaire fail son wrapped around your finger, you need to keep them alive. All, as much as possible. And so, on April 11th, 1928... Kurt Volkart, a professional test driver for Opel, slammed the pedal on the Rack 1 in front of a huge crowd of spectators and journalists. The test was a massive success, even if five of the rockets never actually ignited. Volkart accelerated to 62 miles an hour in 8 seconds, and the news was a publicity bonanza for the Opel company. A month later, Von Opel himself got behind the wheel of the purpose-built Rock 2, and rocketed to a record-setting 148 miles an hour. Oh, now we're getting somewhere. Okay. Yeah. So that was the Opel Rock 2. Over the next year or so, the world's first professional rocket program, which this was, would launch several new rocket-propelled vehicles, or RPVs. The Rock 3 was a rocket train, or basically just a rocket car on rails. It reached 145 miles per hour on its first flight, and on its second flight, it derailed, went flying, and exploded. This sounds like a train in only the most legal sense of it had <laughs> maybe three wheels and rode on tracks. Yeah, it made contact. It also didn't have the wings, which might explain why it derailed immediately. Thankfully, in all of these tests, the pilots are fine. It sounds like fun for the whole family. <laughs> the Yeah, <laughs> the Rock 4 was another rocket train, except this one didn't even derail. It just detonated as soon as it was lit. <laughs> Wait, okay, back up, back up. No, you, you can't just say that, leave it alone. You gave me the complete mental image of we have lit the wick, we are running away, hands over our ears, we're steer, staring at it, and it okay, just disappears. So, so in fairness, the way these worked was they didn't have a wick. What They, they were electronically actuated on these rockets. They were lit by electrodes. So what happened was... Mm -hmm. Especially because Valier understood the he understood the uh, the benefits of staging in the rocket car, for example, it didn't light all twelve engines at once. They were in rows of four, and every time the guy pressed the the pedal down, it would light a new um, row. And these rockets were built differently. Like the top row was for acceleration, the middle row was for more sustained thrust. Exactly. And so on yeah. So forth. And the rocket trains were like that, except I I don't yeah the the rock four just detonated. And then, and then the entire Opel Rock program was forbidden by the railway to ever put a rocket anywhere near trains. <sighs> Something was going to explode as soon as they did so. Yeah. Finally, we get the story of the Rock 1. Now, this might be a little confusing because the Rock 1 was also the name of the first rocket car, but both Valier and Von Opel had always agreed that their main goal would be building the world's first rocket plane. And this is actually a pretty fun story that I, I, I like this story because it really gets into Von Opel's megalomania. Oh, like he just starts to go a little bit crazy, like it's really starting to crank up now or? 
It's not so much the craziness as it is the pettiness. See, the Rock 1 plane wasn't actually the first rocket plane to fly, and if you check it out on Wikipedia or anywhere else online, you will probably see a lot of weasel words that make it seem like it was. They'll say things like, it was the, uh, it was the first purpose-built rocket plane, or it was the first public launch of a rocket plane. Oh, gotcha. As many qualifiers as they can stuff onto it. I- exactly, because he... And he actually lies about this in the time, but... The first rocket plane to ever actually fly was the Ente, or Duck. I don't know if it, Ente, NT, whatever. It's the Duck. This was a modified sailplane that Valier bought. Basically, most gliders, even back then, uh, they still had, like, they had traditional aircraft layout. So, wings up front, and then the tail behind. And which made them very not good for rockets, because the rocket has to be mounted at the back of the aircraft. So, the Duck was a unique design because it, it basically used a canard system. It didn't have a tail, it had the wings in the back, and it had control surfaces up front. And because the wings were in the back, Valier was able to cram the back with a load of rockets. With a test pilot at the controls, Fritz again had to be convinced not to fly, it made two flights before crashing and catching fire as it landed the second time. Uh, the pilot was able to make it out. A miracle. Yeah. So basically the way this is described, it takes off, it does a couple of like slow loops of the, the, um, the airfield. And then as it's landing, it like noses down and just like explodes. Uh, the pilot is able to get out first and it's completely destroyed. Now you might think that that would be a problem for the project, but it wasn't because officially the duck never existed. It's pilot wasn't the first man to fly an airborne rocket and it actually never crashed and burned. That's because Fritz von Opel demanded they cover up its existence so that he could be the first to fly. And he definitely wanted to do that flying in front of a huge crowd. Uh, They built a rocket glider called the Rock One. Uh, Also, and they called it the Rock One because they wanted to cover up the existence as well of the old Rock One car because it wasn't super impressive. What do you mean? That thing was cool as hell. Well, it's it's more so the fact that like Opel wanted to give the impression of of custom built stuff like purpose built for rockets. And both the Duck Glider and the first rocket car, they were not purpose-built. They were modified cars with rockets, like, shoved into them. They didn't look sleek and futuristic. So, Von Opel got his wish on September 30th, 1929, whenever he flew the purpose-built Rock 1 in front of a huge crowd. And he also lied and said that it was the first flight, that he was the first to fly, and he basically got that fame. And it was only until recently that that has actually been corrected. So, in the end, the entire Opel Rock program collapsed shortly after the flight of Fritz's rocket plane. Part of this was because of the Great Depression, but it was mostly because Von Opel had gotten bored. He'd never really been into rockets, and he only cared about them as a way to boost the Opel company and make himself famous. Having achieved that, he ditched the program and moved to Switzerland, cutting off Valier's cash supply. Still, Max tried to go it alone. Though he'd started out as just a writer and astronomer, over the years he'd picked up a good deal of engineering knowledge. He decided that to make a useful rocket plane a reality, he'd need to go back to liquid fuels. At first, this went pretty well. He built an alcohol fuel rocket that could burn for over five minutes straight, and he used it to power the world's first liquid fuel rocket car in April of 1930. And then, less than a month later, while working on another prototype rocket, there was an explosion at Valier's Berlin workshop. Assistants found Max's corpse amid the rubble. It turned out that the prototype he was working on had detonated. Damn. Didn't go so well. They accelerated him straight into the afterlife. Oh. I was going to say much earlier, what was Max Vallier doing between the years of 1939 and 1945? But thankfully, I think. God, I hate that that's what we're what we're reduced to when talking about German rocket guys is Thankfully, he was killed before he had a chance to maybe work for the Nazis. Because Von Oberth, uh, sorry, uh, Hermann Oberth sure as fuck worked for the Nazis. But yeah, and I know that's kind of sudden. This does feel to me like, you know, I know a lot of the time on this show, we talk about rocket failures, especially lethal ones. And there's, I say it's not a freak accident because it's not. There is some very obvious flaw that didn't get picked up or it did get picked up and it got ignored. We just finished talking about Soyuz 11. What is written about this accident? I don't know that there is some, like, he was, I don't think he was smoking next to the alcohol rocket, you know? I think it likely that this was just, that this this one is what falls into the category of just space is dangerous shit happens, as opposed to 
he was being incredibly stupid, if that makes sense. But wasn't everyone at this point in time just chewing down like eight cigarettes a day, bare minimum? Maybe? I actually couldn't find anything written about whether he smoked or not. Like, this is the age of, don't worry, just smoke one, it'll soothe your lungs. (laughs) It's good for you. Smoke every day. Smoke every minute. Legacy. So, there is often a lot of discussion around why Germany became this early hub of rocketry, and why the rocket fad really grabbed Germans specifically. After all, the earliest rocket pioneers were working in Russia and the US. Some people will claim that it's because the Nazis saw the military value of rockets early on and focused on fostering their development. This is true. Military rockets were something that even Weimar Germany was interested in because they weren't covered in the Treaty of Versailles. They were effectively a loophole. But when the Nazis took over in 1933, they actually clamped down on public rocketry, preferring to keep rockets and rocket tests the sole territory of the military. So this is why, like, Werner von Braun... Uh, He leaves the VFR, he leaves this public rocket club, and he goes to work for the military, even well before the war, just as, like, the military wanted to learn rockets, so they hired the rocket kid. This change that the Nazis implemented, it didn't encourage the futuristic rocket fad running through Germany. It killed it. I'm no expert, but it seems from the available evidence that rocket enthusiasts in Germany just got lucky or that they were the first to do it right. Both Cholkovsky in Russia and Goddard in the US made huge leaps in rocket technology and then failed on the follow-up. They couldn't convince anyone to invest big in their ideas. In fact, uh, Goddard, it's kind of a funny story with Goddard. He was incredibly shy. He was basically a a recluse. So after he fires this rocket and like journalists try and hype up his work, he runs from them. He hides from them. He does not want to talk to the media, which means that in the US, The rocket fad has very little staying power. While futuristic, rockets were mostly a novelty, but this was not the case in Germany. And for this, I'm going to quote from an article called The Rocketry and Spaceflight Fad in Germany. Quote, If Oberth had not published in German and so forthrightly discussed manned spaceflight, if Max Vallier had not popularized the idea and had not persuaded Fritz von Opel to finance rocket stunts, and if Opel had not exploited these stunts for all the publicity they were worth, it is difficult to conceive the Weimar rocket fad taking on the scope that it did. Vallier's role was particularly crucial as a popularizer and as the link between Oberth's theory and Opel's money. And... It's unfortunate to think, but that is kind of the biggest lesson to come out of this. Max Vallier discovered the eternal truth of rocket programs. They live and die on hype alone. He set the rule that hasn't changed ever since. During World War II, Walter Dornberger got the V-2 program funded by convincing Hitler that it was a weapon. Sergei Korolev launched Sputnik by pitching the R-7 as the world's first ballistic missile. Both Werner von Braun and Korolev later convinced their respective governments that the space race would prove whose ideology was superior, capitalism or communism. And nowadays, engineers have to wrangle the whims of billionaires running their own mini space races. Max Vallier was the first space evangelist, and it's likely that without his work, modern rocketry would have been very different, probably for the worse. Without him, Germany would not have been a rocketry leader. And without that, it probably would not have developed the V2, which, for better or worse, and I think a lot of it is for worse, it's the root of every rocket that's come since. Without the V2, you don't get the R7, you don't get everything right up to modern rockets. I haven't had a good episode with a rant lesson at the end in a while. Yeah, take it in. Take all the time you need. Rant away. Oh no, I'm done. Oh well, I mean, Uh, if you wanted to keep ranting, I wasn't about to stop you. Well, (laughs) it sounds like the ultimate, you know, sometimes great things happen from a horrible genocide what is the plural of genesis i either way great things can happen i don't i don't want to know that word genesis genesis oh sorry i thought you were saying genocide i thought you were like what is the plural of genesis Genesis, good god man the v2 the v2 does have a horrible genesis and a horrible genocide uh, we will yeah, get to it, that. It's, it, it's the horrible mother for the great things that came afterwards. And audience, to be completely clear here, there are a lot of elements of Valier's life that I left out to be succinct. I do intend to cover them all in the future, uh, especially whenever we talk about like Hermann Oberth, the VFR. Uh, Valier is involved like this. This episode is to give you a kind of clear, concise run through of his life and idea of and an idea of what he worked on. So. That, guys, 
is the story of Max Vallier, the first space evangelist. How do we feel? You know, he died doing what he loved. And um, usually I feel really bad when it's like the, the story isn't just like he died peacefully at the end of his life in his sleep kind of deals. It's yeah. like, a, no, he had a great time with his rocket. Assumably had, I didn't know who he was. And now I kind of know who he was and, um, his death while I guess tragic. I don't know. Yeah. It's just one of those things. Like it, 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 yeah. it it's like a, I can't be mad cause it's like a nobody's fault. Really? It's just, yeah, it and, and to, and to be clear, I don't think he was a bad guy. Like, I think this is, this is one of those episodes that we talk about because it is very important to understanding space history, not because I want to like tar this guy as a failure. He does definitely have failures. Like initially he tries to go the Bill Nye route and it doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't get him the rocket programs he wants. And then he got, and then he got glacial pilled. He gets glacial pilled. He does think that everything is made of ice. And then he he switches tack and he goes so corporate and so mercenary that like Oberth denounces him. It's it's this weird kind of thing where the thing that works, the thing that creates the first rocket program in human history got Valier like thoroughly denounced by all of his science friends. So I think that is as good a spot as any to call it. Audience, good night, good morning, and good afternoon, wherever you are. Mwah. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who has signed up to support the show. And a big shout out to all of our top tier patrons. Our cyborg cats, our boss, Cora Loves Ghost, Matt, and Specter Cohen. Our space dogs are Ben L, Brandon M, Fractal Moonlight, Furious Luddite, John C, Oliver, Sparks, Tom M, Wingsmith, Winter, and Zim. Count 16. Thank you for listening to another episode of Failure to Launch. If you want to follow us, we are Failure to Launch on Blue Sky and FT Launch Pod on Instagram. We also post our episodes with visual aids at Failure to Launch Podcast on YouTube. All music was provided by DJ Danarchy.